said, are they vulnerable right now? Yeah. It gets in your mouth and you have to spit it out. That makes it, that makes it Ask a dumb question. You need the height. I haven't, I haven't done this in a year. And I'm going to watch those. Going across the mountain, oh, fare you well. Going across the mountain, you can hear my banjo tell. Got my rations on my back, my powder, it is dry. I'm going across the mountain, Chrissy, don't you cry. Across the mountain to join the boys in blue. When this war is over, I'll come back to you. Going across the mountain, if I have to crawl, to give old Jeff's men a little of my rifle ball. Good daylight, if nothing happens to me, I'll be way down yonder in old Tennessee. Chapter 1 of Company H by Sam R. Watkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Retrospective, we are one and undivided. About 20 years ago, I think it was, I won't be certain though, a man whose name, if I remember correctly, was William L. Yancey, I write only from memory, and this was a long time ago, took a strange and peculiar notion that the sun rose in the east and set in the west, and that the compass pointed north and south. Not everybody knew at the time that it was but the idiosyncrasy of an unbalanced mind, and that the United States of America had no north, no south, no east, no west. Well, he began to preach the strange doctrine of there being such a thing. He began to have followers. As you know, it matters not how absurd, ridiculous, and preposterous doctrines may be preached, there will be some followers. Well, one man by the name of, I think it was Rhett, said it out loud. He was told to she. Then another fellow by the name, I remember this one because it sounded like a graveyard, Tombs, said so, and he was told a shh, shh, ee, ee. Then after a while, whole heaps of people began to say that they thought there was a north and a south, and after a while, hundreds and thousands and millions said that there was a south, but they were the persons who lived in the direction that the water courses run. Now the people who lived where the water courses started from came down to see about it, and they said, Jess, you are very much mistaken. We came over in the Mayflower, and we used to burn witches for saying that the sun rose in the east and set in the west, because the sun neither rises nor sets. The earth simply turns on its axis, and we know because we are pure Itans. The spokesman of the party was named, I think I remember his name, because it always gave me the blues when I heard it, Horrors Greeley. 
and another person by the name of Charles Sumner said there ain't any north or south, east or west, and you shan't say so either. Now the other people who lived in the direction that the water courses run just raised their bristles and continued saying there is a north and there is a south. When those at the head of the water courses come out furiously mad to coerce those in the direction that water courses run and to make them take it back. Well, they went to gouging and biting, to pulling and scratching at a furious rate. One side elected a captain by the name of Jeff Davis and known as One-Eyed Jeff, and a first lieutenant by the name of Alex Stevens, commonly styled Smart Alec. The other side selected as captain the son of Nancy Hanks of Bowling Green and a son of old Bob Lincoln, the rail splitter, and whose name was Abe. Well, after he was elected captain, they elected his first lieutenant, an individual of doubtful blood by the name of Hannibal Hamlin, being a descendant of the generation of Ham, the bad son of old Noah, who meant to curse him blue but overdid the thing and cursed him black. Well, as I said before, they went to fighting, but old Abe's side got the best of the argument but in getting the best of the argument, they called in all the people and the wise men of other nations of the earth, and they too said that America had no cardinal points, and that the sun did not rise in the east and set in the west, and that the compass did not point either north or south. Well then, Captain Jeff Davis's side gave it up and quit, and they too went to saying that there is no north, no south, no east, no west, well, us boys all took a small part in the practice, and Shep the Prophet remarked that the day would come when those who once believed that the American continent had cardinal points would be ashamed to own it. That day has arrived. America has no north, no south, no east, no west. The sun rises over the hills and sets over the mountains. The compass just points up and down. And we can laugh now at the absurd notion of there being a north and a south. Well, reader, let me whisper in your ear. I was in the row, and the following pages will tell what part I took and the little unpleasant misconception of there being such a thing as a north and south. The Bloody Chasm in these memoirs, after the lapse of 20 years, we propose to fight our battles o'er again. To do this is but a pastime and pleasure, as there is nothing that so much delights the old soldier as to revisit the scenes and battlefields with which he was once so familiar, and to recall the incidents, though trifling they may have been at the time. The histories of the lost cause are all written out by big bugs, generals and renowned historians, and like the fellow who called a turtle a cooter, being told that no such word as cooter was in Webster's dictionary, remarked that he had as much right to make a dictionary as Mr. Webster or any other man. So have I to write a history. But in these pages, I do not pretend to write the history of the war. I only give a few sketches and incidents that came under the observation of a high private in the rear ranks of the rebel army. Of course, the histories are all correct. They tell of great achievements, of great men, who wear the laurels of victory, have grand presents given them, high positions in civil life, presidents of corporations, governors of states, official positions, etc. And when they die, long obituaries are published telling their many virtues, their distinguished victories, etc. And when they are buried, the whole country goes in mourning and is called upon to buy an elegant monument to erect over the remains of so distinguished and brave a general, etc. But in the following pages, I propose to tell of the fellows who did the shooting and killing, the fortifying and ditching, the sweeping of the streets, the drilling, the standing guard, picket, and vidette, and who drew, or were to draw, eleven dollars per month in rations, and also drew the ramrod and tore the cartridge. Pardon me should I use the personal pronoun I too frequently, as I do not wish to be called egotistical, for I only write of what I saw as a humble private in the rear rank of an infantry regiment, commonly called Webfoot. Neither do I propose to make this a connected journal, for I write entirely from memory. And you must remember, kind reader, that these things happened twenty years ago, and twenty years is a long time in the life of any individual. 
I was 21 years old then, and at that time I was not married. Now I have a house full of young rebels, clustering around my knees and bumping against my elbow while I write these reminiscences of the War of Secession, Rebellion, States' Rights, Slavery, or our rights in the territories, or by whatever other name it may be called. These are all with the past now, and the North and South have long ago shaken hands across the bloody chasm. The flag of the Southern cause has been furled, never to be again unfurled, gone like a dream of yesterday, and lives only in the memory of those who lived through those bloody days and times. 1861 Reader mind, did you live in that stormy period? In the year of our Lord, 1861, do you remember those stirring times? Do you recollect in that year, for the first time in your life, of hearing Dixie and the Bonnie Blue Flag? Fort Sumter was fired upon from Charleston by troops under General Beauregard, and Major Anderson of the Federal Army surrendered. The die was cast. War was declared. Lincoln called for troops from Tennessee and all the southern states, but Tennessee, loyal to her southern sister states, passed the Ordinance of Secession and enlisted under the Stars and Bars. From that day on, every person, almost, was eager for the war, and we were all afraid it would be over and we not be in the fight. Companies were made up, regiments organized, left, left, left was heard from morning till night. By the right flank, file left, march, were familiar sounds. Everywhere could be seen southern cockades made by the ladies and our sweethearts, and some who afterwards became Union men made the most fiery secession speeches. Flags made by the ladies were presented to companies, and to hear the young orators tell of how they would protect that flag, and that they would come back with a flag or come not at all, and if they fell, they would fall with their backs to the field and their feet to the foe, would fairly make our hair stand on end with intense patriotism. And we wanted to march right off and whip 20 Yankees. But well, we soon found out that the glory of war was at home among the ladies and not upon the field of blood and carnage of death where our comrades were mutilated and torn by shot and shell. And to see the cheek blanch and to hear the fervent prayer, I, I might say the agony of mind were very different indeed from the patriotic times at home. Camp Cheatham. After being drilled and disciplined at Camp Cheatham under the administrative ability of General R.C. Foster III for two months, we, the 1st, 3rd, and 11th Tennessee regiments, Maney, Brown, and Raines, learned of the advance of McClellan's army into Virginia toward Harper's Ferry and Bull Run. The Federal Army was advancing all along the line. They expected to march right into the heart of the South, set the Negroes free, take our property, and whip the rebels back into the Union. But they soon found that secession was a bigger mouthful than they could swallow at one gobble. They found the people of the South in earnest. Secession may have been wrong in the abstract, and has been tried and settled by the arbitrament of the sword and bayonet. But I am as firm in my convictions today of the right of secession as I was in 1861. The South is our country. The North is the country of those who live there. We are an agricultural people. They are a manufacturing people. They are the descendants of the good old Puritan Plymouth Rock stock. And we of the South from the proud and aristocratic stock of Cavaliers. We believe in the doctrine of states' rights. They in the doctrine of centralization. John C. Calhoun, Patrick Henry, and Randolph of Roanoke saw the venom under their wings and warned the North of the consequences but they laughed at them. We only fought for our state rights, they for union and power. The South fell, battling under the banner of state rights, but yet grand and glorious even in death. Now, reader, please pardon the digression. It is every word that we will say in behalf of the rights of secession in the following pages. The question has been long ago settled and is buried forever, never in this age or generation to be resurrected. The vote of the regiment was taken, and we all voted to go to Virginia. The Southern Confederacy had established its capital at Richmond. A man by the name of Jackson, who kept a hotel in Maryland, had raised the stars and bars, and a federal officer by the name of Ellsworth tore it down. 
and Jackson had riddled his body with buckshot from a double-barreled shotgun. First blood for the South. Everywhere the enemy were advancing, the red clouds of war were booming up everywhere. But in this particular epic, I refer you to the history of that period. A private soldier is but an automaton, a machine that works by the command of a good, bad, or indifferent engineer, and is presumed to know nothing of all these great events. His business is to load and shoot, stand picket, videt, etc., while the officers sleep, or perhaps die on the field of battle and glory. And his obituary and epitaph but one remembered among the slain, but to what company, regiment, brigade, or corps he belongs, there is no account. He is soon forgotten. A long line of boxcars was drawn up at Camp Cheatham one morning in July. The bugle sounded to strike tents and to place everything on board the cars. We old comrades have gotten together and laughed a hundred times at the plunder and property that we had accumulated, compared with our subsequent scanty wardrobe. Every soldier had enough blankets, shirts, pants, and old boots to last a year, and the empty bottles and jugs would have set up a first-class drugstore. In addition, every one of us had his gun, cartridge box, knapsack, and three days' rations, a pistol on each side and a long bowie knife that had been presented to us by William Wood of Columbia, Tennessee. We got in and on top of the boxcars, the whistle sounded, and amid the waving of hats, handkerchiefs, and flags, we bid a long farewell and forever to old Camp Cheatham. Arriving at Nashville, the citizens turned out en masse to receive us, and again we were reminded of the good old times and the gal we left behind us. Ah, it is worth soldiering to receive such welcomes as this. The Reverend Mr. Elliot invited us to his college grove, where had been prepared enough of the good things of earth to gratify the taste of the most fastidious epicure. And what was most novel, we were waited on by the most beautiful young ladies, pupils of his school. It was charming, I tell you. Reverend C.D. Elliott was our brigade chaplain all through the war, and Dr. C.T. Quintard, the chaplain of the 1st Tennessee Regiment, two of the best men who ever lived. Quintard is the present Bishop of Tennessee. On the road. Leaving Nashville, we went bowling along 20 or 30 miles an hour, as fast as steam could carry us. At every town and station, citizens and ladies were waving their handkerchiefs and hurrahing for Jeff Davis and the
The Reverend Mr. Elliot invited us to his college grove, where had been prepared enough of the good things of earth to gratify the taste of the most fastidious epicure. And what was most novel, we were waited on by the most beautiful young ladies, pupils of his school. It was charming, I tell you. Reverend C. D. Elliot was our brigade chaplain all through the war, and Dr. C. T. Quintard, the chaplain of the 1st Tennessee Regiment, two of the best men who ever lived. Quintard is the present Bishop of Tennessee. On the road. Leaving Nashville, we went bowling along 20 or 30 miles an hour, as fast as steam could carry us. At every town and station, citizens and ladies were waving their handkerchiefs and hurrahing for Jeff Davis and the Southern Confederacy. Magnificent banquets were prepared for us all along the entire route. It was one magnificent festival from one end of the line to the other. At Chattanooga, Knoxville, Bristol, Farmville, Lynchburg, everywhere, the same demonstrations of joy and welcome greeted us. Ah, those were glorious times. And you, reader, see why the old soldier loves to live over again that happy period. But the Yankees were advancing on Manassas. July 21st finds us a hundred miles from that fierce day's battle. That night, after the battle is fought and won, our train draws up at Manassas Junction. Well, what news? Everyone was wild, nay, frenzied with the excitement of victory. And we felt very much like the boy the calf had run over. We felt that the war was over and that we would have to return home without ever seeing a Yankee soldier. Ah, oh, how we envied those that were wounded. We thought at that time that we would have given a thousand dollars to have been in the battle and to have had our arm shot off so we could have returned home with an empty sleeve. But the battle was over and we left out. Stanton. From Manassas, our train moved on to Stanton, Virginia. Here we again went into camp, overhauled kettles, pots, buckets, jugs, and tents, and found everything so tangled up and mixed that we could not tell t'other from which. We stretched our tents, and the soldiers once again felt that restraint and discipline to which we had almost forgotten en route to this place. But as the war was over now, our captains, colonels, and generals were not hard on the boys, in fact, had begun to electioneer a little for the legislature and for Congress. In fact, some wanted and were looking forward to the time to run for governor of Tennessee. Staten was a big place, whiskey was cheap, and good Virginia tobacco was plentiful, and the currency of the country was gold and silver. The state asylums for the blind and insane were here, and we visited all the places of interest. Here is where we first saw the game called chuck a -luck, afterwards so popular in the Army. But I always noticed that Chuck won, and luck always lost. Pharaoh and Roulette were in full blast. In fact, the scum had begun to come to the surface, and shoddy was the gentleman. By this, I mean that civil law had been suspended. The ermine of the judges had been overridden by the sword and bayonet. In other words, the military had absorbed the civil. Hence, the gambler was in his glory. Warm Springs, Virginia. One day while we were idling around camp, June Tucker sounded the assembly and we were ordered aboard the cars. We pulled out for Millboro. From there we had to foot it to Bath Alum and Warm Springs. We went over the Allegheny Mountains. I was on every march that was ever made by the 1st Tennessee Regiment during the whole war. And at this time I cannot remember of ever experiencing a harder or more fatiguing march. It seemed that mountain was piled upon mountain. No sooner would we arrive at a place that seemed to be the top than another view of a higher and yet higher mountain would rise before us. From the foot to the top of the mountain, the soldiers lined the road, broken down and exhausted. First one blanket was thrown away, and then another. Now and then a good pair of pants, old boots and shoes, Sunday hats, pistols and bowie knives strewed the road. Old bottles and jugs and various and sundry articles were lying pell-mell everywhere. Up and up and onward and upward we pulled and toiled until we reached the very top when there burst upon our view one of the grandest and most beautiful landscapes we ever beheld. Nestled in the valley right before us is Bath Alum and Warm Springs. It seemed to me at that time and since a glimpse of a better and brighter world beyond to the weary Christian pilgrim who may have been toiling on his journey for years. A glad shout arose from those who had gained the top, 
which cheered and encouraged the others to persevere. At last, we got to Warm Springs. Here they had a nice warm dinner waiting for us. They had a large bathhouse at Warm Springs, a large pool of water arranged so that the person could go in any depth he might desire. It was a free thing, and we pitched in. We had no idea of the enervating effect it would have upon our physical systems, and as the water was but little past tepid, we stayed in a good long time. But when we came out, we were as limp as dish rags. About this time, the assembly sounded, and we were ordered to march. But we couldn't march worth a cent. There we had to stay until our systems had had sufficient recuperation. And we would wonder what all this marching was for, as the war was over, anyhow. compared with our subsequent scanty wardrobe. Every soldier had enough blankets, shirts, pants, and old boots to last a year, and the empty bottles and jugs would have set up a first-class drugstore. 
In addition, every one of us had his gun, cartridge box, knapsack, and three days' rations, a pistol on each side and a long bowie knife that had been presented to us by William Wood of Columbia, Tennessee.
Magnificent banquets were prepared for us all along the entire route. It was one magnificent festival from one end of the line to the other. At Chattanooga, Knoxville, Bristol, Farmville, Lynchburg, everywhere, the same demonstrations of joy and welcome greeted us. Ah, those were glorious times, and you, readers, see why the old soldier loves to live over again that happy period. But the Yankees were advancing on Manassas. July 21st finds us a hundred miles from that fierce day's battle. That night, after the battle is fought and won, our train draws up at Manassas Junction. Well, what news? Everyone was wild, nay, frenzied with the excitement of victory, and we felt very much like the boy the calf had run over. We felt that the war was over and that we would have to return home without ever seeing a Yankee soldier. Ah, oh, how we envied those that were wounded. We thought at that time that we would have given a thousand dollars to have been in the battle and to have had our arm shot off so we could have returned home with an empty sleeve. But the battle was over and we left out. Stanton. From Manassas, our train moved on to Stanton, Virginia. Here we again went into camp, overhauled kettles, pots, buckets, jugs, and tents, and found everything so tangled up and mixed that we could not tell t'other from which. We stretched our tents, and the soldiers once again felt that restraint and discipline to which we had almost forgotten en route to this place. But as the war was over now, our captains, colonels, and generals were not hard on the boys. In fact, had begun to electioneer a little for the legislature and for Congress. In fact, some wanted and were looking forward to the time to run for governor of Tennessee. Staten was a big place, whiskey was cheap, and good Virginia tobacco was plentiful, and the currency of the country was gold and silver. The state asylums for the blind and insane were here, and we visited all the places of interest. Here is where we first saw the game called chuck a -Lock, afterwards so popular in the Army. But I always noticed that Chuck won, and Luck always lost. Farrow and Roulette were in full blast. In fact, the scum had begun to come to the surface, and shoddy was the gentleman. By this, I mean that civil law had been suspended. The ermine of the judges had been overridden by the sword and bayonet. In other words, the military had absorbed the civil. Hence, the gambler was in his glory. Warm Springs, Virginia. One day while we were idling around camp, June Tucker sounded the assembly and we were ordered aboard the cars. We pulled out for Millboro. From there we had to foot it to Bath Alum and Warm Springs. We went over the Allegheny Mountains. I was on every march that was ever made by the 1st Tennessee Regiment during the whole war. And at this time I cannot remember of ever experiencing a harder or more fatiguing march. It seemed that mountain was piled upon mountain. No sooner would we arrive at a place that seemed to be the top than another view of a higher and yet higher mountain would rise before us. From the foot to the top of the mountain, the soldiers lined the road, broken down and exhausted. First one blanket was thrown away, and then another. Now and then a good pair of pants, old boots and shoes, Sunday hats, pistols and bowie knives strewed the road. Old bottles and jugs and various and sundry articles were lying pell-mell everywhere. Up and up and onward and upward we pulled and toiled until we reached the very top when there burst upon our view one of the grandest and most beautiful landscapes we ever beheld. Nestled in the valley right before us is Bath Alum and Warm Springs. It seemed to me at that time and since a glimpse of a better and brighter world beyond to the weary Christian pilgrim who may have been toiling on his journey for years. A glad shout arose from those who had gained the top, which cheered and encouraged the others to persevere. At last we got to Warm Springs. Here they had a nice warm dinner waiting for us. They had a large bathhouse at Warm Springs, a large pool of water arranged so that the person could go in any depth he might desire. It was a free thing and we pitched in. We had no idea of the enervating effect it would have upon our physical systems, and as the water was but little past tepid, we stayed in a good long time. But when we came out, we were as limp as dish rags. About this time, the assembly sounded, and we were ordered to march. Well, we couldn't march worth a cent. There we had to stay until our systems had had sufficient recuperation. And we would wonder what all this marching was for, as the war was over, anyhow. 
The second day after leaving Warm Springs, we came to Big Springs. It was in the month of August, and the biggest white frost fell that I ever saw in winter. The Yankees were reported to be in close proximity to us, and Captain Field, with a detail of ten men, was sent forward on the scout. I was on the detail, and when we left camp that evening, it was dark and dreary and drizzling rain. After a while, the rain began to come down harder and harder, and every one of us was wet and drenched to the skin, guns, cartridges, and powder. The next morning, about daylight, while standing vidette, I saw a body of 25 or 30 Yankees approaching, and I raised my gun for the purpose of shooting and pulled down, but the cap popped. They discovered me and popped three or four caps at me. Their powder was wet also. Before I could get on a fresh cap, Captain Field came running up with his seven shooting rifle and the first fire he killed a Yankee. They broke and run. Captain Field did all the firing, but every time he pulled down, he brought a Yankee. I have forgotten the number that he did kill, but if I'm not mistaken, it was either 20 or 21, for I remember the incident was in almost every Southern paper at the time and the general comments were that one southern man was equal to 20 Yankees. While we were in hot pursuit, one truly brave and magnanimous Yankee, who had been badly wounded, said, Gentlemen, you have killed me, but not a hundred yards from here is the main line. We did not go any further, but halted right there, and after getting all the information that we could out of the wounded Yankee, we returned to camp. One evening, General Robert E. Lee came to our camp. He was a fine-looking gentleman and wore a mustache. He was dressed in blue cottonade and looked like some good boy's grandpa. I felt like going up to him and saying, Good evening, Uncle Bob. I am not certain of this late day that I did not do so. I remember going up mighty close and sitting there and listening to his conversation with the officers of our regiment. He had a calm and collected air about him. His voice was kind and tender, and his eye was as gentle as a dove's. His whole makeup of form and person, looks and manner had a kind of gentle and soothing magnetism about it that drew everyone to him and made them love, respect, and honor him. I fell in love with the old gentleman and felt like going home with him. I know I have never seen a finer looking man, nor one with more kind and gentle features and manners. His horse was standing nipping the grass, and when I saw that he was getting ready to start, I ran and caught his horse and led him up to him. He took the reins of the bridle in his hand and said, Thank you, my son, rode off, and my heart went with him. There was none of his staff with him. He had on no sword or pistol or anything to show his rank. The only thing that I remember he had was an opera glass hung over his shoulder by a strap. Leaving Big Springs, we marched on day by day across Greenbrier and Golly Rivers to Huntersville, a little but sprightly town hid in the very fastness of the mountains. The people live exceedingly well in these mountains. They had plenty of honey and buckwheat cakes, and they called buttermilk sour milk. And sour milk weren't fit for pigs. They couldn't see how folks drank sour milk. But sauerkraut was good. Everything seemed to grow in the mountains. Potatoes, Irish and sweet, onions, snap beans, peas, though the country was very thinly populated. Deer, bear, and foxes, as well as wild turkeys and rabbits and squirrels abounded everywhere. Apples and peaches were abundant, and everywhere the people had apple butter for every meal. And occasionally we would come across a small-sized distillery, which we would at once start doing duty. We drank the singlings while they were hot. But like the old woman who could not eat cornbread until she heard that they made whiskey out of corn, then she could manage to worry a little of it down. So it was with us and the singlings. From this time forward we were ever on the march, tramp, 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 always on the march. Lee's Corps, Stonewall Jackson's division. I refer you to the histories for the marches and tramps made by these commanders the first year of the war. Well, we followed them. Cheat Mountain. One evening.